Uh, as, we, as you turn to your Bibles uh, to chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, uh, today in our passage, we're going to see this uh, friendship, this bond that, uh, that Jonathan and David had together. And, and throughout this passage, we're going to see a theme uh, within their relationship and within their friendship. And in verse 8 of chapter 20, it says that they had a covenant with each other before the Lord. And then in verse 23, it says, The Lord is witness between you and me forever. And then in verse 42, it says, The Lord is between you and me and your descendants and my descendants. So as we walk through this passage, we're going to see uh, within the relationship, they have a bond with each other that Christ or that God is between. And I think it's a great reminder for us that in our relationships, uh, as we interact with folks, uh, with, especially within the church, within the body of Christ, uh, that, that we remember that Christ is the bond between us. Uh, that, that our relationships uh, are, are important, that our relationships uh, should, should be tight and bonded, and that is because of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, as, we, as we think about what Jesus has done for us, Nate, uh, you gave us a, a great reminder as we remember in communion uh, what Christ did for us going to the cross and dying and then uh, rising again uh, so, and conquering death that we may have eternal life. In John chapter 17, verse 21, Jesus is saying, uh, he says, That all of them may be one. Father, just as you and me are one, and I am in, in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe in him who sent me. So Jesus, this is as he's ending uh, or nearing the end of his ministry here on earth before uh, he goes to the cross for us. Uh, he is praying to the Father and he's praying that, uh, that, that, that those that are left as Jesus dies on the cross, specifically his disciples, then his church, which would be us, uh, would be united in him. Uh, that there would be this bond of unity. Uh, up on the screen, you see this triangle, uh, the, the triangle illustration of, of, of us and, or me and others and God. Uh, this is an illustration that uh, I heard when I was like 14 years old at a marriage conference. Uh, don't ask me why I was 14 and at a marriage conference, uh, but I was, uh, and, uh, and I remember it to this day. Uh, the pastor had a uh, man on one side, woman on the other side, and then God in the middle, and it was a reminder that as we keep God as the center, as we grow towards God, we grow together with each other. And, and, and that's the same for us in our relationships with one another, uh, in non-marriage relationships. As we grow towards Christ, we should be growing together because of the bonds that we have in Christ. And we're going to see this in the relationship that David and Jonathan have today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us, and then Ken's going to come read our passage for us. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. Lord, thank you for how uh, it speaks to us. Lord, I pray now as we, as we read this passage, as we read this chapter, Lord, that you would uh, convict our hearts. Lord, that you would uh, encourage us to be uh, knit together, to be unified in you. Lord, that we would have uh, relationships with one another that would resemble the relationship that David and Jonathan have. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. as Pastor Noel said, we're going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 20. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied. You're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. 
But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well I found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. So David said, Look, tomorrow is the new moon feast, and I'm supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says, Very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure he is determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, Jonathan said. If I had the least inkling my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let's go out into the field. So they went there together. Then Jonathan said to David, I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel, that I will surely sound out my father by this time the day after tomorrow. If he's favorably disposed toward you, I will not send you word. Will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with Jonathan, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth." So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm this oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon feast. You will be missed, because your seat will be empty. The day after tomorrow toward evening, go to the place where you hid when this trouble began, and wait by the stone Ezel. I will shoot three arrows to the side of it, as though I were shooting at a target. Then I will send a boy and say, Go, find the arrows. If I say to him, Look, the arrows are on this side of you, bring them here. Then come, because as surely as the Lord lives, you are safe. There is no danger. But if I say to the boy, Look, the arrows are beyond you, then you must go, because the Lord has sent you away. And about the matter you and I discussed, remember, the Lord is witness between you and me forever. So David hid in the field, and when the new moon feast came, the king sat down to eat. He sat in his customary place by the wall opposite Jonathan, and Abner sat next to Saul, but David's place was empty. Saul said nothing that day, for he thought something must have happened to David to make him ceremonially unclean. Surely he is unclean. But the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. Then Saul said to his son Jonathan, Why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, Let me go because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town, and my brother has ordered me to be there. If I found favor in your eyes, let me get away to see my brothers. That is why he's not come to the king's table. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you've sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew his father intended to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger on that second day of the feast. He did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. In the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for his meeting with David. He had a small boy with him, and he said to the boy, Run and find the arrows I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out after him, Isn't the arrow beyond you? Then he shouted, Hurry, go quickly, don't stop. 
The boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master. The boy knew nothing about all this, only Jonathan and David knew. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said, Go, carry them back to town. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to the town. Thank you, Ken. In this passage, there's three truths I want us to understand about David and Jonathan's uh, friendship that they had here, this relationship that they had with each other. And the first is that it's a relationship built on the truth. The second is we're going to see this agreement they had between friends. And then the third is the loving actions between friends. The first one, in verses 1 through 3, we see a relationship built on the truth. As we look at uh, the beginning of this passage, we see where David comes to Jonathan and he says, Jonathan, what have, what have I done? Jonathan, what's, what's my crime? Uh, and how have I wronged the king? So, so David is, is coming to Jonathan, who's the son of the king. Uh, David is anointed as uh, to be the next king, and he asks Jonathan some really, some real questions. Jonathan, what have I done? Jonathan, have I, have I done anything wrong? I, Jonathan, if I've done anything wrong, uh, if I haven't done anything wrong, why does your dad want to kill me? Please help me in this way. Uh, and, and he asks these questions, and, 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 he, and it shows us that the relationship, he's trusting Jonathan with, uh, with Jonathan to tell him the truth. We see where Jonathan's answer, uh, he says, you're not going to die. Uh, Jonathan answers them with, uh, with, with, you're not going to die. The king is not going to kill you. Uh, he says, if the king is going to kill you, he would have told me first. Uh, it's interesting that, that Jonathan doesn't answer those questions for David. And I believe that he doesn't answer the questions like, Jonathan, David, you haven't done anything wrong. Because Jonathan knows that David hasn't done anything wrong. Uh, because they have that close-knit relationship, Jonathan doesn't even have to answer uh, he doesn't even have to reveal to him, David, you haven't done anything wrong. Uh, but, but we see here this willingness of David to ask these important questions. It, it gives us a good reminder for us. Do we have people in our lives uh, that, that we can go to and ask hard questions? Uh, do we have people in our lives that if we go to them asking them hard questions about ourselves, will they tell us the truth? Uh, will, they, will they tell us, yeah, you have, you have done wrong by the king or you haven't done wrong by the king. Uh, you need to change this in your life or you need to ask this person for forgiveness. It's a great reminder for us that we need to have people like Jonathan and David had for each other, that we can know and trust that they are going to tell us the truth. In verse 3, uh, verse 3, as uh, David is uh, hearing Jonathan's answer back, uh, Jonathan saying, I wouldn't hide this from you. It's not so. You're not going to die. Uh, David answers Jonathan back. He says, I, you're, you know your father very well and I have favor in your eyes, Jonathan. Uh, so your dad is not going to tell you the truth about me. Uh, your dad probably is not going to reveal to you his plans for me. Uh, but David then goes on to give, uh, he says that I am one step between life and death. Uh, he goes on to tell Jonathan, I'm one step between life and death. As, John, as David was living, uh, he knew that at any moment, at any time, uh, the king could take his life. Uh, the king uh, has already tried, actually, uh, three times 
to murder David. And he sent out, uh, he sent out lynchmen uh, last week to, to try to find David and to kill David. Uh, so David is living in this, I, I know that I'm one step away from death. Isn't this, isn't this true for all of us? Isn't this true for all of us that uh, we are just one step away? away from death. Maybe we, as we look around, we don't think, okay, somebody is trying to kill me uh, or somebody is going to try to take my life. Uh, but we are reminded every day that life is fragile, uh, that life uh, is here for a moment and then it's gone. And, and it reminds us uh, that, that we are just one step away. And it should be a reminder to us to live in that way. Do we live in a way recognizing and knowing that we are one step away from death? What does that look like? What does that look like for, for us? For us uh, to know that we're one step away from death uh, would mean that we would do everything in our power that the people around us would know about the love of Jesus. Uh, if, if we are really truly living one step away from death, the people around us would know the, the most important relationship that we have, and that is with our Savior. We would probably also make sure we have short accounts with the people around us. We'd probably make sure that the relationships that are close to us, uh, we've taken care of and asked for forgiveness. We've repented uh, to each other, uh, and we've made that relationship correct. Do we live in a way knowing and recognizing that there's only one step between us and death? I hope so. I hope we do. Saul, our, our David and Jonathan's relationship was built on truth. Uh, was built uh, in a way that they could ask each other the tough questions. Where they could face tough circumstances together, uh, being willing to give each other uh, truthful answers to each other. Are our relationships built on the truth? And then in verses 4 through 15, uh, we see where David and uh, Jonathan devise a plan uh, to, to understand what what Saul's actions are going to be. Uh, so they, together, they, they, they come up with a plan. They said, okay, uh, it's the new moon feast. Uh, every, at the beginning of every month, the, the Israelites would celebrate uh, the new month. And it was a new moon, which would mean there was almost no moon in the sky or just a sliver of the moon in the sky. And that was the beginning of the month. They would usually celebrate this new moon feast for a day or two. Uh, they would eat together together. Uh, and they would celebrate uh, the, the new month. David uh, was supposed to be dining with the king. Uh, David now a command, one of the commanders in the army. Uh, David also uh, is, is Saul's uh, right-hand man, his armor bearer, uh, should be at this feast. So they devise a plan that David isn't going to show up to the feast. Uh, and, and then Jonathan is going to... Is going to to go talk to his father uh, and see how his father is feeling about David. So basically he says uh, that you're going to go talk to your dad, and if your dad is upset about me not being here, if your dad's mad that I'm not at the feast, we will know that your dad is intending to kill me, uh, that your dad is intending to do me harm. If your dad isn't upset, if your dad just kind of blows it off, is not too worried about it, uh, then 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 we'll know that I'm safe. I wonder, I wonder why they would even why they would even kind of ponder that. David has already been tried, or Saul has already tried to kill David uh, a number of times. He's made his his position known. Uh, he tried to stick him with a spear to the wall. Uh, and uh, but but now they have this, I wonder where. Where Saul's at? I wonder where the king's at. Is the king really going to try to kill me? Well, if we look back into chapter 19, we see where Saul comes into the presence of Samuel, and, and we see where, uh, where he is prophesying because the Holy Spirit has come upon him. Uh, and, and, and people are now saying, is Saul amongst the prophets? 
So I kind of wonder if David and Jonathan are thinking, did Saul have a change of heart? Uh, did, Saul, uh, did, did, did Saul change his mind? Did Saul change his heart and now is uh, maybe going to live in a way that is uh, honoring to God? Uh, I, I don't believe, obviously, Saul uh, was intending to live in a way that's honored God. I actually believe that the Holy Spirit came upon Saul that David would be able to get away, uh, that David would be able to escape But uh, David and Jonathan uh, might be wondering, where's Saul at? So they have this uh, meal together uh, and and they devise a plan that Jonathan's going to ask his dad uh, about uh, about David and we're going to find out uh, Saul's answer. And if he's mad, then David, your life's in jeopardy. And if he's not mad, then you're safe at least for now. They also come up with a way of, of telling each other uh, the king's answer or telling each other, David, this is what you need to do. We see where they devise a plan together that, uh, that David would go hide uh, in the rocks and Jonathan would bring uh, his armor bearer, a young lad, it says, uh, and shoot an arrow. And if Jonathan shoots an arrow beyond the lad and says, go run and get it. That was word to David that he needs to get out of town. Uh, that was word to David that your life's in jeopardy. Uh, if, 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 if Jonathan were to say the arrow's beyond you, it's further, go run, David would know. If, if Jonathan were to say to the, the young lad, your arrow's this way, come towards me, uh, it is not beyond you, then David would know that his life was, uh, was going to be spared and that his life was okay and he could stay put. In verses 16 through 23, we see this agreement. Uh, we see this agreement. It says, so, so Jonathan made a covenant with David saying, may the Lord call David's enemies to an account. And Jonathan said, or Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as himself. And then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow's a new moon feast, so you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And the day after tomorrow, go to the place where you've hid and where, when the trouble began and wait. I'll shoot these arrows. We've already explained what's going to happen there. So they, they, they didn't reaffirm their love for each other. They reaffirmed this agreement that they have with each other. This agreement they have amongst friends is that they're going to care for each other. This agreement they have amongst friends is uh, no matter what happens uh, to each other, no matter what trouble may come their way, they're going to stand up for each other. No matter what, uh, maybe, and maybe it's death that's going to come their way, they're going to stand up for their descendants. So in verses 16 through 23, we see this agreement amongst friends. Do you, you have friends that you know you can turn to when there's trouble? Do you have people in your life that you know you can call upon when there's trouble? That there's an agreement that I'm going to help you, that I'm going to take care of you. And and maybe for some of us, we we say, "I, I don't know if I have those friends. I don't know if I have those people in my life. Or I feel like people around me have have hurt me or have let me down. My challenge for you in that way would be, are you being that friend to other people? Are you being that person uh, who is there and is loving and is caring? They have this agreement amongst friends and we should long uh, to have this bond in the same way amongst our friends that we would care and love for each, love each other no matter what the circumstances are. So the first we see this relationship's built on truth, and then we see this agreement between friends that they will do whatever they can for each other. In verses 24 through 34, now we see the plan acted out. Uh, we, see, uh, we see the plan acted out. We see that the feast has started. Uh, David is uh, hid himself, and the new feast has come upon. They're sitting, they're eating, Saul's sitting in the corner, which they said along, amongst the wall or along the wall, which is his normal spot, and, uh, and, and they're eating together, and so far, Saul hasn't said anything. 
Saul uh, doesn't say anything about David being, being gone. And, and, and then he starts to notice, okay, David's not here. And he says, uh, something must have happened to David to make him ceremonially unclean. Surely he's unclean. So Saul uh, starts to notice, okay, David's not here. Uh, David uh, didn't come to the feast. He should have been here. And uh, he goes, he must be unclean. He'll be here tomorrow, basically, is what Saul's saying. Uh, he's ceremonially unclean. He needs to uh, wash himself. He needs to purify himself. And then he probably will be here tomorrow. But the next day, he doesn't show up. Uh, and now the second day of the month, and his place is empty again. And Saul then uh, asks Jonathan, uh, where has the son of Jesse gone? Uh, how come he's not at the meal? He wasn't here today, uh, and he wasn't, he's not here now. He wasn't here yesterday. It's interesting, Saul's, Saul's the way he addresses who David is. Saul uh, says, where is the son of Jesse? Saul now has a relationship with David. Uh, Saul, Saul has been around David quite a bit. Uh, Saul could have called David by his name, Jonathan, where is your friend David? Jonathan, how come your friend David is not here? Hey, Jonathan, how come, how come one of my employees, David, is not here? Maybe a little more, uh, a little more uh, tight-knit, a little more favorable response. He could have said, where is the great warrior David? Uh, where is the giant killer David? Where is the man that's slain his ten thousands David? But he doesn't. He says, where's... Where's the son of Jesse? Jesse was kind of a, a normal man. He was uh, probably, uh, probably not a wealthy man, which is why David kept the sheep. So Saul here is immediately insulting David by calling him the son of Jesse, by basically saying, where's that poor guy's kid, David? Reveals a little bit about where Saul's at with David. Jonathan answers David, and he says that uh, he gave David permission to go to Bethlehem, uh, to go to his family's uh, meal, to go to his family's feast that they were having, and, uh, and so I let him go, is what Jonathan says. Uh, we know that David's now hiding in the field, and, and in verse 30, we see where Saul's anger, it says it flared up. I think that that might be an understatement. Uh, that the, just like the flare up of an anger, because we know that eventually he's going to try to kill his own son. It's probably uh, he burned with rage and passion uh, in, in the answer that that he gave uh, that Jonathan gave to his son. It says his anger flared up, uh, and and he strikes out with him with his words. We know that that from the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. Uh, so, so this immediately reveals where Saul's heart is at, not only towards God, but towards David. And he says, uh, you're the son of a wicked and rebellious woman. He basically, he basically cusses him out. Uh, he, to, to say it really, really nice. He cusses out his own son uh, at at this feast, probably in front of others, uh, he basically says that his son is shameful, and, and, and he says as long as, as he lives, as long as David lives, the son of Jesse, he says, Jonathan, you're not going to become king as long as David's alive. So we see where Saul's anger flares. He cusses his own son out. He says, we got to kill this guy. He goes, if we don't kill this guy, son, you're not going to become king. Well, Jonathan already knows. Jonathan already knows that he's not going to become king. And what we do know about Jonathan is Jonathan is a man uh, that loves God. Jonathan is a man that, that as, from what we see here, as it seems, uh, he does what's right. And he's willing to honor God. He already knows my kingdom's not going to be established because David has been anointed king. Then in verse uh, 34, we see uh, where Jonathan questions his father. So they're probably in this heated uh, kind of rage of a conversation. Uh, Saul just cusses him out. David, or then Jonathan answers back. He says, why should David be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asks his father. Notice Saul doesn't answer him. 
Notice Saul doesn't say, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you what he's done wrong. Let me give you a list of things that Jonathan has done wrong to, to, to deserve being put to death. I, he, he can't do that. I, but he immediately what he does is he throws his spear at him. I, so he, he doesn't answer Jonathan, but he tries to kill Jonathan. It says here that he throws his spear at him uh, to kill him, and Jonathan knew that his father was in, had intended to kill David. So here, at this point, Jonathan uh, knows if he, if he was wondering uh, what his father's intentions were, uh, he now knows my dad is going to kill David. My dad wants to kill David so bad, he just tried to kill me, basically, is what, what happens here. Jonathan then gets up from the table, and he goes uh, to where David is at. We see where, uh, where, da- where Jonathan now is going to act out uh, the plan that they had come up with a couple, uh, couple verses ago. They, he goes out to David. Uh, he knows uh, that David is hiding amongst the rocks, and, and he has his young boy with him, maybe his armor bearer, and he shoots the arrows, and he shoots them past David. Uh, he shoots them past uh, the young armor bearer, the young boy that's with him. He calls out to him, uh, isn't the arrow beyond you? Imagine David hiding in the rocks, curled maybe up, out of the way, uh, not wanting people to see him, not wanting to make a sight for himself. Uh, and he hears the arrow whiz over his head and past his head, and it keeps going. And he's like, oh, the king's going to kill me. The king's going to kill me. Then he hears Jonathan, and he's like, well, maybe Jonathan missed that shot. Then he hears Jonathan, then shout out to the young boy, arrows beyond you. David now knows. David now knows the king is going to kill him. He now knows that his life is going to be turned upside down. Uh, That his life is no longer going to be the same. From this point forward, we're going to see where David is going to be on the run. Uh, David is going to be on the run for his life. Uh, We've seen just a little Kind of a little part of him being on the run for his life where Saul's tried to kill him a couple times. Uh, But now for the next 10 to 15 years of David's life, uh, he's going to be on the run. He's going to see the king try to kill him over and over and over again. As as David hears uh, that the arrows are beyond him, Jonathan then sends uh, his young boy uh, with the arrows Uh, He's already given a word to David. He sends the young boy with his arrows uh, back to town. And now he's going to have a short meeting with David. In verses 35 through 42, we see these loving actions between friends. We see these loving actions between friends. Uh, Not only does does Jonathan follow the plan, uh, reveals his father's heart, uh, but Jonathan really is putting himself on the line for David. Jonathan's willing to to honor his word no matter what. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3, or verse 3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others better than yourself. We see where Jonathan has has acted this out. Uh, Where Jonathan could have have heard from the king that I'm going to kill David and wanted nothing else to do with David. He could have heard from the king that I'm going to kill David, seen the king try to kill him. He could have ran and hid on his own by himself. But instead, he says, you know what? David's life's important. David's life's important and and I'm not going to be selfish for myself, but I'm going to value his life above mine. We see where Jonathan goes and meets with David. Right there, Jonathan is putting himself on the line, putting himself in danger, just being around David uh, for the good uh, of David. Jonathan does these things. He sends the young boy back now, and, uh, and it says that Jonathan and David, uh, they, they meet up. Uh, they meet up on the south side of the stone, uh, and then David bows down before Jonathan. David understands what Jonathan has done. David understands the love uh, that Jonathan has for him. Uh, he understands the care that Jonathan uh, has for him, and he understands the difficult position that Jonathan is in. 
We see where the God's anointed king bows down to the person who should have been king, rightfully so, if his father hadn't sinned so many times. We see these loving actions. Jonathan humbles himself, goes to David, puts himself on the line, uh, puts himself in harm's way because he loves and cares for David. Further on, we see uh, where now they, Jonathan says to David, he says, uh, or, or further on, as, as they're talking, uh, as David is bowed down to Jonathan uh, with his face on the ground, it says that they kiss each other and they weep together, but David wept the most. It's important for us to note and understand uh, many uh, liberal theologians will take this passage uh, and try to say that David and Jonathan had some sort, of, uh, some sort of homosexual relationship because they kiss and they weep with each other. Uh, it's not true. Uh, we don't see this. Uh, actually, in uh, the ancient Near East culture, uh, kissing, uh, even amongst a man, would have been very normal. Uh, it would have been a normal way of greeting each other. Uh, now, for us, it's weird. Uh, for us, if, uh, if Frank were to try to greet me and kiss me, I would, I would flinch backwards. But for them, it makes sense. Uh, for them, uh, it, is, it is a normal greeting, and it shows that they have this affection amongst friends. And then they, they weep together. They weep together because they know that this relationship that they have, this friendship that they have is not going to be the same. This friendship that they have is, is not going to go on and carry on like it has uh, in the past. It says, they wept together, but David wept the most. Why would David weep the most? Well, David's life is the life that's going to be turned upside down. David's life is the life that's going to be on the run. Jonathan gets to return home. Maybe Jonathan and his dad are going to have a tough time uh, together with each other, but David is now going to be on the run. David doesn't get to go back to the palace. He doesn't get to go back to playing his harp for the king. Uh, he doesn't get to go back to being the commander of, uh, of, of the king's army or one of the commanders in the king's army, but he's going he's gonna to go and he's going to be on the run. And so David cries more because he knows that his life is going to be turned upside down by King Saul. They kiss and they weep together. In Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, it says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. We see this here with David and Jonathan. They have this sincere love for each other uh, and, and they hate the evil that, their, that Jonathan's father, that Saul is doing, but they stay devoted to each other and they honor each other above themselves. Here, uh, at the very end of this passage, Jonathan then says to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me, between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to town. So here at the end, uh, they have this goodbye, and Jonathan looks at David, and he says, Look, we've sworn our friendship. You know that I love you. You know that I care about you. Uh, you know uh, the oath that we took to each other. We're going to care for each other. Not only are we going to care for each other, but we're going to care for each other's descendants. At this point, at this point, they don't know if David's going to die or if Jonathan's going to die. Uh, they don't know. I mean, we know that David knows that he's been anointed king. Uh, but, but at this point in their lives, as they're looking, David knows the king's trying to kill him. Jonathan knows that his dad just tried to kill him. And, and he says, remember, we swore an oath between you and me and your descendants and my descendants forever, that we will love and care for each other. As we think about this oath, it's, it's a, a pretty cool testi testament to David, actually. David, after he becomes king uh, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we see where David asks, Do we, does Jonathan have any other descendants? Are there any other of Jonathan's living relatives, uh, anybody from Saul's clan still alive? Uh, and, and David finds one of Jonathan's sons. 
uh, that, that is lame, he can't walk. Uh, and David cares for him. Uh, David brings him into the palace and he cares for this, uh, this man that, that can't walk. And we see where David honors his oath that he had with Jonathan many, many years later. Loving actions between friends. As we think about the friends and the people in our lives, as we think about the relationships that we have with one another, are our relationships built on truth? Can we speak truth to each other? We see this agreement between friends that they are going to care for each other and love each other no matter what the circumstances. And then we also see this loving action between friends where they aren't selfish amongst each other, where they're devoted to each other even long after the commitment's made. Do we have friendships like that? Do we have relationships like that? I encourage us to be building relationships that will stand the test of time that will be built on truth, that will, be, uh, that will be noble and there will be agreements amongst friends and that will be actions. There will be actions that show that we love each other. Let's pray. Lord, we, we love you. Lord, as we think about these actions amongst friends, we're reminded of, of the actions you showed by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. Lord, that, uh, that, that you would love us that much, that you would send your only Son. Lord, as we think about the friends in our lives and the relationships that we have, we pray that we would be, one, we would be people that would love each other. Lord, that we would uh, have relationships built on the truth and that we would be willing to stand up and not be selfish and to be ambitious for your truth, be devoted to each other. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.